Um, I, uh, first of all, I want to um, thank you, Megan, and thank you, uh, Dan and uh, Citrus and uh, Microsoft for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's it. Uh, you guys familiar with uh, with the NPR show? Um, wait, wait, don't tell me. Like, I feel like it's it's not my job time. Um, <laughs> So I, but I, I hope that I can speak um, to some of the some of the relevant points, and um, and for those of you who are um, academic mentors, I uh, I can only wish for you that you would have a, a, a postdoc that is as um, as gratifying and successful as Megan Lawrence. So that's um, it's it's a it's a big love fest. Um, so uh, I think that the reason I was asked to talk today is um, because basically what I do at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute is I invent stuff. I invent cool stuff for blind people. And as a blind scientist, engineer, and designer, um, I have a unique perspective on the types of tools that make a difference to blind people. Now, I don't, um, I don't sort of assume that the things that I need are the things that everybody needs. I, um, I, you know, uh, supplement, and uh, I, I actually supplement knowledge with my experience rather than the other way around. And I use my understanding of blindness and disability and my sort of history of being embedded in the Berkeley disability community uh, as a springboard for understanding universal design and how we can create technologies, not only for blind people, but for everybody that might be useful. And I think that um, probably uh, the idea was Josh will come and you know talk about how AI can be applied to uh, technology, and, and maybe I'll talk about that a little bit, but that's secretly not, uh, I think, the most interesting thing I have to say. Um, so as a designer, engineer, scientist, um, inventor, mad, mad scientist, um, I, uh, the kinds of tools that I like to invent are, first of all, blind people, the major problem we face is access to information. Information is the thing that we, uh, that we are sort of, the most barriers exist to us getting good, um, good access to the information we need in order to do the things we want to do. So whether that's uh, education, uh, employment, entertainment, what I call the three E's, uh, there are all sorts of barriers to the information we want and need. And so that's really been my life's work so far is to, um, to figure out how to do um, cool, uh, smart, inexpensive, and hopefully um, adapted mainstream uh, um, things in order to get better access to the information we want. So, um, so I'm going to give you a few examples of the kinds of things that I've done. And I'm going to, um, as I go through, I'll sort of talk a little bit about, um, about how AI might, might be used in those contexts. So one of the, in fact, when Megan was, uh, was in my lab, um, one of the main things that we were doing at that time was uh, looking at new ways for video description to be created. For those of you who don't know what video description is, you can think of it sort of as the converse to captioning. Captioning is um, making the audio part of a visual of a of a video production accessible so that you can see the audio component of it. And um, description is the opposite. Description is uh, making the visual part audible so that a blind person can uh, know approximately or for the most part what's going on on the screen and benefit from that video. Uh, and you know, as video becomes more and more important in uh, education and uh, and training. Video is uh, the access to video is more and more essential. It's not um, it's not 1970s TV shows anymore. It's stuff related to your livelihood and your and your ability to achieve um, academic success. So the um, so the the tools that we created were this like you know very simple set of um, of web based tools that would allow anybody anywhere to add voiceover tracks to existing web-based videos. So we, we used YouTube as one of our prime, um, you know, as sort of our, our, our use case, our best example, because YouTube has so much, uh, so much material and it tends to be uh, of a particular, you know, short, you know, most, most of the videos on YouTube are pretty short. So it means that it's 
um, not as much of an arduous production to actually sit in front of your web browser and your microphone and add some audio annotation about what's going on on the, on the screen. So uh, that's what we've done. It's been up and running for um, over five years. It's called You Describe. And um, so far, it's completely human driven. But obviously, there are some AI applications for that, right? Obviously, we can. Um, we could imagine tools that would, you know, essentially screen scrape the video, pull out the text, uh, maybe do some facial identification, maybe do some gesture identification, be able to add um, at least text-based and then uh, through text-to-speech, uh, speech-based annotations to that video with no human intervention at all. That would be a very straightforward application of AI to an existing problem that, that, uh, that we have, an accessibility problem. And to pull in the universal design case, uh, we should remember that video description, um, as with many accessibility tools, is intended originally for blind people, but is finding, uh, is finding applications in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of areas, including um, for, um, uh, for people who have difficulty identifying uh, affect or for uh, um, language learners or for, um, for people who need, um, you know, uh, have difficulty focusing on large scenes. So there's a, a really interesting um, sort of diversity of potential uses for this kind of technology. Um, another uh, tool that Megan was, uh, you know, helped uh, in the initial research phases of is a tool, um, an iOS app we've released called Over There, which is a, um, a wayfinding app. It's a, um, it is a very simple uh, thing that lets you point your iPhone in uh, any particular direction and using Google Places, it tells you what's in that direction and it has a little line of sight algorithm that you know, makes sure that it uh, you know, tries to keep it to within you know, a block or so of where you are and, um, and the ability to simply point your phone and very dynamically be able to you know, find out what's in that direction is really, a, is really a very powerful tool. AI could enhance that type of function as well. Like, um, or if you think about uh, a similar tool that Microsoft actually developed called, um, uh, called uh, Soundscapes, there's, um, it presents a, a sort of sonifi a, a, a sonified um, landscape, an audio landscape of what's around you um, using, you know, using your head position and using your location uh, to know what should be sound like it's on your left and what should sound like it's on your right and what should sound like it's in front of you and behind you. However, um, if you apply an AI solution to the filtering problem, which is really what we face there, um, when you're walking around, there are so many things around you. As a sighted person, um, you, most sighted people don't read all of the text in their environment. They don't look at all of the stores in their environment. They don't take in all of the, um, all of the features that they see, but they do, um, they do filter on a, you know, sort of a pre-attentional level the things that they're interested in. They might notice that there are an awful lot of nail salons on this block. They might notice that, they're, um, that you know, there's a, uh, a restaurant with an unusual name. And these are the sorts of things that we um, could apply uh, AI to. The idea that you don't want to know about everything, you just want to know about what you want to know about. And then you get into the problem of how do you train, how do you train that. But these are some of the examples of, of the sorts of things that, um, that uh, we could apply artificial intelligence and, and deep learning to. Um, so, you know, I love my job. I get to invent all sorts of cool stuff for blind people, and I get to participate in amazing conversations like this. But sometimes I um, wonder what else I could be doing. Sometimes I think maybe I should go look for a job in industry. And so at one, in, in one of these crises of confidence, one of these paroxysms of, of wondering if I should be doing something else, I actually put together a resume and I sent it out to a bunch of um, uh, places I sent it to, uh, in particular, I sent it to a designer. I put together a, a, a design recruiter, right? I thought I could be, I'm, I'm a designer, I design all sorts of stuff. I, um, and so I put together a resume and I sent it to a design recruiter with a cover letter that said, I'm a blind designer, I've been 
working in the field of accessibility technology and uh, designing products for 30 years. And um, here's my resume. Give me a call if you're interested, right? She called me, uh, you know, pretty quick. She called me and she said, I am fascinated. What makes you think you could be a designer? <laughs> and that's the real problem. That's the real problem we're facing. It's not, a, I mean, yes, of course, all of the dilemmas about AI and privacy and, um, and you know, the fact that we're going to teach bias to, the, to the, um, the systems that are going to be doing the, the resume filtering, all of that, those are, those are the issues. But the, the, the deep issues that I want to sort of call your attention to are the ones that we've been dealing with the whole time. It's not, they're not new. They don't have anything to do with AI. It has to do with the bias of society, and it has to do with the way, the opportunities that people have in order to create the tools that make a difference to people with disabilities, elders, any of the edge cases that, that Utah um, and others were talking about. And um, here I have to admit to you that the things, the, 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 big, the big impact of what I, what I have to say has already been touched on by everyone, right? Um, Utah uh, mentioned Dan, um, Dan, of course, and, um, and Megan and Anita. Um, we've all sort of touched on this idea of user-centered design and the importance of inclusion in, uh, in what we do. Um, if we're going to create tools that have an impact on specific populations, and I think we're he thinking here mostly about people with disabilities and um, elders and other sort of other people who are outside the main stream of employment, um, we need to ensure that there are the right minds, the right voices are part of, not just, not just part of that conversation, but at the core of that conversation. The tools that I've created, I don't think that other people, I don't think that a cited um, inventor would have thought of the, the types of tools that I've thought of. And um, I am in a deep minority as a highly educated, pretty successful blind person. I am definitely the 1%. And um, when we talk about employment, we realize that, uh, you know, we throw around these numbers, like, you know, who, you know, it's hard to say what the real numbers are, but a lot of people with disabilities are unemployed. And it doesn't start when they graduate from college. A lot of people with disabilities are discriminated against in their, um, in their education. They don't, they're, 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 um, if you have a disability as a student and you are, you know, you disclose and all of that, um, even if you don't disclose, there are significant barriers against the likelihood of your success. And, um, and so, uh, so the real problem, the thing that we need to think about um, in order to bootstrap the, the essential need for user-centered design as we, as we create these AI tools of the future that are going to impact people with disabilities and elders. As we develop those tools, we need to make sure that the people that know the most about those tools and what tools are needed are the voices that are not just testing the things that um, non-disabled engineers think about, but the people that are uh, proposing the ideas, saying, this is, this is what we really need. This is how I could be successful if I had this. Um, and a whole dialogue about how to do that. So let me just tell you quick, um, my little um, uh, contribution. So uh, this is like a huge societal problem. This is not just an American problem. This is a global problem. People with disabilities are not at the table. They're not, ed we, don't, we don't get to have, uh, we don't get to achieve the kind of education that, uh, that one would want if you were going into the tech sector or the design sector. We don't um, have the, um, we don't have the expectation of success. We are, we have the expectation of, um, well, I mean, the disability uh, as, as, as uncomfortable, you know, we, we keep throwing away words, we threw away cripple, we threw away, uh, you know, um, a bunch of other words and disabled will be thrown away soon too because um, none of them actually say what we want, but disabled basically says, not abled, right? 
Um, and so, you know, you look at you look at the assumptions that go into how we um, uh, do that, and the real problem is getting those getting those voices, those minds, um, through the educational system and into a position where we can um, have voices that will make an impact. And so one of the things that I'm doing, um, and, and I think that just by telling this story, I'm hoping that it'll sort of stimulate other ideas in this room about how to, um, how to teach AI to non-standard um, non -standard student groups, uh, including students with disabilities, and including um, uh, people, you know, six, the 65 plus, the people who may not have uh, computer science degrees or technical skills, but who are aging and who understand the problems that they're facing and could be the designers of the technologies of the future if they're, if they're taught what tools are out there and available for implementation and use. So, um, so the, um, the thing, I'm, I'm doing this thing called the Blind Arduino Project, which is basically a, um, uh, an effort to not only um, teach blind people about how to build stuff with um, the, the maker, you know, the tools of the maker movement, hobby robotics, um, and, uh, you know, and everybody's darling, the, these little microprocessors that are, that are used in everything from, um, from very early computer science and, um, and uh, electrical education up through uh, building, you know, scientific equipment that you launch into space. These um, Arduino, for those of you who don't know, is just a microprocessor platform. It's open source and it's being used um, everywhere. It's like it's a little computer, and you can essentially connect up lots of. Um, you can connect up sensors to it and actuators, and you can uh, give it a you know connect it to the internet. It's part of the whole Internet of Things. Uh, conversation, but basically we're teaching blind people how to build stuff with Arduino, and um, because at, there's, there's two parts of the problem. One is that on the face of it, it looks like you couldn't do it. It's, there are lots of reasons. Uh, for example, the, uh, the development tools are not accessible, right? So, um, but there are ways. There are ways around it. So one thing, we're teaching people to build stuff with Arduino, and the other um, is that we're not just teaching them, but we're teaching them to design, teaching people to design tools that fix problems that they have as uh, people with uh, mostly, you know, mostly blind people. But we're, again, we're, um, this is sort of a, a test balloon that I, I see as an opportunity for, um, you know, uh, a, a real renaissance of DIY accessibility stuff across the board. And um, the, the idea here is that we're, I'm, I'm running workshops and teaching young blind kids and older blind adults how to build stuff and how to think about building stuff that they need, how to design the tools that they want to impact their own accessibility needs. And that's um, incredibly exciting for people. Um, when uh, you can't go on Amazon and buy an accessible voltmeter, okay? Um, you have to build your own. And while you're at it, you might as well um, incorporate the features that no sighted designer would think of because they're unique to the way a blind person would use a voltmeter. So the, um, if you think about what this, this project is doing, it's not just teaching um, blind kids to build stuff. Um, I'll, I'll take a quick aside and tell you that um, many uh, at, at a bunch of these workshops, I'll ask the kids, I'll say, okay, so how many of you have a robotics club in your high school or in your school? And they all say, me, me, I do, I have a robotics club in my school. And I say, how many of you are on the robotics clubs in your school? And there's silence. And it's because not only do they think they can't do it, but their teachers think they can't do it. Or it would be too much work for the teachers to, to sort of scaffold these kids into success in a, um, in a robotics class or a robotics club. But by teaching these kids that they can, and, and by the end of the workshops, they know they can, they will go back to their schools and tell their teachers and their classmates, I can do that too, and if they want to. And I'm not saying all, 
you know, blind and disabled people should become computer nerds, but if they don't, it should be because they don't want to, not because somebody told them they couldn't. And um, um, and the uh, the idea is that by embedding them secretly in these robotics clubs, um, what's going to happen? The idea that I what I'm hoping for is that we will get a generation. We will begin to sort of see an emerging generation of kids, blind kids and sighted kids that are learning about um, robotics and AI and other um, you know, related technologies together, and also teaching about accessibility together. Um, learning about what could be built, what kinds of tools are necessary, and with the idea that these blind kids will then go through, you know, have the opportunity to go into STEM fields in college, and then be successful STEM, uh, you know, be successful uh, uh, you know, people in getting tech jobs and designing the tools of the future, and not just the blind kids, but these sighted kids that grow up alongside them will also be getting tech jobs and saying, well, I mean, what's, what's weird about that? Like I, you know, Johnny was in my, you know, was in my robotics class and we, you know, we built all sorts of cool stuff, you know, to let him measure, you know, measure voltages and, and, you know, he was a, he was, he was one of the members. And, by it's a long term strategy and it's you know it's just one aspect but this is the essential we have to sort of cultivate this societal shift away from the idea that um disability and age are um disqualifying uh disqualifying factors in one's ability to contribute um and the people that we have to contribute to, um, not only can we contribute to uh, each other and accessibility, but we can contribute in um, in obvious, you know, obviously the aim is that we contribute to everyone's uh, benefit. And so, again, bringing it back to um, the idea of AI and what what are the tools that will be that will be built with AI? I actually I think it's a little bit crazy that we're even talking about this. Because um, AI is like, it is just gonna be ubiquitous. It's like, imagine getting together in 1968 and talking about the impact of the of the microchip on disability. I mean, it's like we wouldn't, we would not have been able to predict what was gonna happen. And just just as we are now, there's no way for us to predict what's going to happen. But um, we can be sure that the tools will get better, the AI tools will get better, more powerful, and more ubiquitous. And that if we have the right people in place to design the tools, ideally we won't be stuck always catching up. We won't be stuck always slapping an accessibility solution onto something that doesn't work for us. Um, which, as you all know, is inefficient, more expensive, and usually doesn't give you an interface or a, a tool that is actually what you ultimately want. Designing it from the get-go with accessibility in mind is the way to go, and the only way to do that is through real commitment to user-centered design, and you can't have real commitment to user-centered design unless the users are the ones initiating the projects. Um, and lots of other stuff. <laughs> so, um, uh, I just want to, I want to, again, um, th this is sort of a, a, a hopscotch through my thinking about this, this stuff. And I, um, I hope I haven't been too repetitive or too redundant with what was said earlier. I'm just trying to underscore the most important aspects and, um, and uh, because I feel like I've hit them all, I'm going to stop. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to um, taking your questions. Yeah, did, did anybody else notice that the question system is inaccessible? <laughs> um, I'm also not going to recognize hands, so um, do you, do you want to call on people or do you want people to just call out? Okay, sure. 
Hi, Josh. This is Gagan. Uh, thanks a lot for ca carrying on that conversation further about low societal expectations. I am curious uh, for all the people who are present here uh, that Americans with Disability Act was passed in 1990, and there have been a lot of a uh, lot of uh, focus on anti-discrimination and equality, and uh, there have been such progressive laws uh, uh, around that time uh, in the space of education, also, which you mentioned. Uh, the policy landscape is there, but the societal expectations are still very poor. From whatever I'm gathering from you, if it's going to be like this in the United States, uh, you could very well imagine the situation in Global South. Is there a way? to circumnavigate this problem in your assessment? Um, I don't know how to do it. It is, it is, it is a pernicious problem. And um, maybe there's some stuff to be said um, uh, for, you know, for virtualizing people's existences. Maybe the, the more we work on the web, the more we sort of uh, can disguise ourselves digitally, the less stigma will be associated with, you know, whatever particular, you know, so it's not just disability. I mean, there's lots of opportunity, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? Um, but, but I mean, maybe there's, maybe there are ways to use that um, to our advantage. I was, you know, I asked the question earlier of um, Sharon, Cheryl, um, uh, about you know, by by sort of anonymizing workers on the web, um, you don't get to push the uh, the social uh, the social norms at all. Like nobody sees the the 80, 89 year old in the office working if they're just working from home behind sort of anonymized uh, credentials. Um, and so that's a that's a real challenge to think about the the sort of tension between um, between uh, being open about who you are and what your disability uh, is and being able to participate um, despite people's assumptions and low expectations and and prejudices and um, maybe maybe there's a combination of those uh, those uh, things that we can use in interesting ways to um, to give people with disabilities and elders more opportunities than they would have um, and you know maybe there's some Big reveal at the end. I don't know, but yeah, I'm sorry, Gagan. I don't have I don't have a good one for that. Hi, hi this, is, this is Isabel. This is not really um, a question. It's more a comment that suggested uh, this uh, answer that you gave. That in a sense we are all disabled because we are very susceptible to the uh, image we project onto others, and uh, it's very visible by the fact that people are trying to have a persona on the internet that is right. not their true self. Yeah. And you know, so there's this whole thing that I, I actually was going to mention earlier and I, I, I skipped over it. But um, there's, you know, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the whole field of disability studies and the, um, the idea that really disability is, is um, a societal artifact as opposed to a physical artifact. It's, a, it's, it's, a, um, it's something that gets, you, you are only disabled in a uh, societal and technological context. And a lot of, you know, if, if you have the right context, then your disability doesn't really um, impact you or others. And so the sort of social construction of disability is, is an interesting, um, it's an important way to think about uh, perceptions of disability. And, and the societal construction of disability is not just, um, you know, in our, in our uh, you know, physical infrastructure and things that keep people from participating, but it's our, it's, it's attitudes, um, and attitudes not just held by people without disabilities. There's plenty of sort of self-limitation by people with disabilities and elders. So I wanted to um, ask a question and make a comment at the same time, which is that we often talk about disability or any type of difference that we might have salient from a standpoint of not having similar skills or similar advantages to whatever the other is, the normative other. Yep. And I'm just thinking of the conversation and the fact that as someone who is blind and doesn't depend on sight as a way to judge the world, 
which is really how a lot of us who are sighted judge the world and takes us down paths we often don't want to go. You know, what could you offer? Or maybe there's some opportunity for the person that doesn't use sight as a screening tool to teach us how to be better at that. You know, I, I'm sort of tipping it the other direction is the perspective of being blind has benefits that could enhance our sighted people's capabilities that are limiting. Yeah, no, and, and that's, um, that's, you know, for sure, um, the diversity that we talked about, the diversity of perspective, the diversity of experience, diversity um, of culture, these are all um, uh, potential strengths if, um, if viewed and used properly. Um, I am, uh, I feel like I'm at a distinct advantage in that I don't have to look at billboards and I'm not, you know, uh, distracted by uh, a lot of visual garbage that's put up in your environment for you to buy things and, and you know, want to spend money in various ways. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, yeah, there are, there are perspectives I have, and that's probably the, you know, that's, I, I think that that's uh, why I was asked to share my ideas with you today, is because, because of that unique perspective that I have. Um, and, um, and, you know, my, my blind perspective is, a, while, um, while probably shared by many other blind people, is unique and is not, you know, I'm not speaking for the blind, I'm just speaking for, for me and everybody, you know, that's, that's the beauty of diversity of perspective. Um, one blind person's idea of things is not every blind person's idea of things. And, um, but sure, that's, I, I agree, that's, that's, you know, we have power in difference. Okay, are there any additional questions? Hey Josh, Bob Dolan. Okay. Um, are you concerned that the ubiquity of AI is going to provide uh, less incentive for young blind students to learn Braille? No, actually. Um, so Braille is one of these things that everybody's just horrified. You know, everybody, there's, there's people on one side saying, uh, you know, Braille is dying, we don't need Braille anymore. And then there's people on the other side saying we need Braille more than ever. Um, so Braille is... Um, a reading technology. It's a way for a blind person to read. Um, and uh, while there are other ways to take in information, it is a uh, it is a uniquely powerful tool um, as a uh, as a student. You know, you know, in I would not have been able to to get an undergraduate degree in in a physical science if I had to you if I had to do math auditorily. Um, it was Braille that enabled me to be able to write and, and work equations. Um, uh, if you want to read poetry, if you want to take notes, if you want to do any number of um, sort of uh, things where you where the written the written word is um, is a critical element, then Braille is is essential. It's not um, it's not the only way to do things. But I think um, that Braille. Uh, my my hope is that the same AI tools that will be used to, um, to teach, uh, you know, to teach literacy for, uh, for sighted kids will be used to teach literacy for blind kids. There's, um, you know, we can use, uh, we have refreshable braille displays that are, you know, essentially little pin arrays that pop up and down and um, they're touch sensitive and uh, you could have a very productive, interactive, adaptive braille learning experience um, with just the hardware we already have. You don't need to invent any new hardware for it. You just need to invent the, the, the AI system. Is it, can, I, can I put that one forward, Megan? Um, so, uh, so yeah, so there's, um, I don't think that, again, it's the people, not the technology, that's going to limit uh, Braille literacy if it, if, if it happens. Hi, Josh, it's Yuta. Um, I wanted to comment and then ask a question. Um, the comment is regarding the answer to um, how do you get a job or how do you do an it? So the, the notion of hiding your disability or disguising your disability in order to get a job. And I think it's a, a bit of a catch-22, but it would 
cause unintended consequences because it, I, I think what we need to do is not hide diversity or yeah. difference. Yeah. Uh, we need as much exposure as possible. Um, and of course, that means we have to somehow get into the gate. But it, it reminds me of... Just, um, just to interrupt you, and I'll let you go on again, but I, I want to be clear that I wasn't proposing that as a solution. I was just sort of uh, yeah, throwing ideas around right. out loud. Right. But, but yeah. that, that's yeah. a bad idea. Don't anybody think that that was a good idea? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. But um, one other term that was flashed up on the screen in the first presentation was uh, singularity and the whole notion of reaching singularity. And if you talk to the individuals that are part of Singularity University, they they dismiss the, the issue of disability, saying that right. <laughs> we will have that uh, we will have that solved with yeah. either some sort yeah. of genetic um, uh, intelligence or uh, whatever. That d disability is not something to be concerned about. And that actually scares me yeah. quite a bit yeah. because um, the, the notion that we would create the super race um, that uh, would be somewhat monolithic and homogenous and not have the diversity that... Um, the, our, any sort of vulnerability or fr fragility ha offers us is something that I, I, I think is um, counter to many of the the values. Uh, anyways, I, I would love to hear your comment to that discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was uh, presenting at the International Space Society not too long ago about the the importance of accessibility for um, spacecraft and space colony uh, interface design because for reasons I probably don't need to go into. And, and this was the comment offered by one of the audience members. Oh, well, pretty soon we're not going to have disabled people anyway. So, you know, we don't need to worry about it. And, and you know, my, my answer just was, you know, so, okay, so you've got an astronaut, you know, on board a, a, a habitat who suffers, a, you know, a a terrible decompression and freezing accident, and you're going to tell me that that person isn't going to have, you know, need some sort of rehabilitation, some sort of um, accommodations in order to uh, continue doing the job they were doing. Um, and so I, I think that that's disingenuous. I think that as long as we are human, as long as we have any kind of body, no matter what that body is, we will continue to have the idea of um, whole and not whole, of healthy and not healthy, of abled and not abled, because we are humans. We love to create us and them. We love to create distinctions between people who can and people who can't. And um, we do that no matter what. So, um, so even if we are able to um, engineer out uh, physical difference, um, you know, blindness, uh, deafness, even if we can engineer those things out, we will always have um, something that we want to distinguish uh, by. And um, I think uh, actually we're headed for a world where there's going to be a lot more neurodiversity than we have now um, because of all of the different sort of um, possibilities in term, you know, for. Um, assistive and augmentative uh, you know, cognition. Um, now, now I'm showing my science. Did anybody else read uh, uh, 2312? Ken Stanley Robinson, great book. Um, but it sort of, it makes you realize uh, that um, as, we, as we gain greater genetic control over you know, our bodies, um, diversity is gonna increase, not decrease. Um, and so there, there will always be bodies that aren't properly, you know, aren't, aren't suited to a particular environment. Another great example of sort of disability science fiction is um, Lois McMaster Pujold's um, Quadis, uh, genetically people genetically engineered with four, with no legs and four arms uh, for, for orbital, uh, orbital um, uh, life. And, and the sort of the questions and ideas about disability and difference that come up as a, as a result of uh, that are fascinating and really, really worth thinking about um, because that's 
probably where we're headed. We're not, we're not going to a place where disability will be engineered out of us. We're going to a place where we're gonna be able to mess with our bodies so much that we won't be able to be adapted for every environment and there'll be even more opportunities for people to discriminate against each other based on what they look like. Okay. Uh, it's gonna be great. Josh, we have... We have just about a minute left and one last question. Um, so you kind of answered the question that I was going to ask, which was um, getting back to the social construction of disability. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to comment on transhumanism and just that tension between seeing disability as difference and seeing disability as something to be corrected or moved beyond, and especially as technology and engineering allows us to kind of push the boundaries of physical ability and other types of abilities, like how do you have, how do you center that conversation around values and priorities and how we define ourselves? Wow, I, I think you might think I'm someone else. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, as long as we're, I, I, I feel like I said pretty much everything I have to say in the previous thing. I mean, as long as we're able to find something to be different about each other, I think we're going to be, um, we're going to be able to, uh, I don't think we're going to move past discrimination in, as, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to move past it. I think at, at best, we will learn how to manage it properly. Um, and part of learning how to manage it properly is understanding that, that difference, as uncomfortable as it makes us feel, is a powerful ally to, um, to success as a, a larger group. Um, we, don't, we don't want a human monoculture. And I think that even, even the people who are um, sort of the most uh, virulent might realize that, uh, that there's, there is power in diversity um, on a biological level. And Josh, thank you very much for your enlightening keynote. Thank you.